have to do our own media. It has to come from the grassroots. It has to be democratic. And I'm really glad that Dave's here to tell you about what, what we need to do. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much, Peter, and thanks everybody for coming today. It was a free speech zone, and uh, it was about as big as this, and behind a big, big wall. You couldn't go anywhere. And so I was there with my camera, and all the journalists went inside the big tent. They all went to get drunk. So like a good journalist, independent journalist, I went to the little bar down the street, and we were getting drunk in there. And all of a sudden, all these fire engines, police cars come flying by, and I run up to the scene. I was the only one there. There were only a couple of people with cameras. And I see this uh, mounted police officer basically slapping this guy's face with the horse's muzzle. You know, like, he went to the left, and he went to the right, and, he, and, the, and the horse has this little metal bit in it, right? He was making a mess. Of, and you could see from the picture that the uh, veteran had his arms behind his back. He was screaming the whole time, nonviolent, nonviolent, and he didn't move. He was just letting this happen to him. These guys were trying to pull him out of the way, out of harm's way. But this is the sidewalk, and it was very clear during the whole event that if you went on the street, you would get arrested. But if you're on the sidewalk, you know, you're going to be okay. So the well-worn button. Yeah, so um, this is now the front of the horse on the sidewalk, the veteran on the ground with that rear hoof, the next button, a little bit more clear. You can see that this is the front of the horse on the sidewalk. That's the horse's rear hoof, and that's the veteran's face. Yeah, and this is never a good sign when you see a baton and a pop-eyed, four-armed uh, gentleman in the foreground. Never a good sign, right? So uh, the next side you can see clearly now the horse is really up on the sidewalk. There, there wasn't much room. It was about the size of a horse. And uh, the next thing you know, because of that officer, the next slide shows um, what that officer did. He basically, you go to the next one. He basically pushed this woman. Yeah, well, you didn't see it, but the, there was a slide in there that shows her being thrown into. This is the first woman that I saw when I came on the scene. So I started interviewing her with my video camera. And I didn't have a street light. I was trying to put her under a street light. You know the deal, Jim, right? You know, Bruce. <laughs> Get her under a street light or whatever. So you got some lights and $100 video camera. So I could clearly see she was dazed and said, you know, stop the interview. You've got to go to that ambulance, which was between me and John, you know, back, back of this room. And the police wouldn't let her go to the ambulance, even though she was clearly clearly injured. Uh, next slide is, uh, I only got a couple more slides here. This is Nick Morgan, uh, Iraq Veterans Against the War. This was a planned act of civil disobedience. You know, it was, what, it was publicized. They knew it was going to happen. And this was the result of uh, Nick's injuries. So anyway, next slide is, um, what, what, what would you do? You know, so I called up Huffington Post. I got this exclusive footage. It's five, it's quarter of nine. I could go into the big tent right now and watch the debate till it's over at 11 when traffic and all that, get home, midnight, upload the footage. By 6 a.m. you'll have a story. Or I can go home right now to the office and upload all the stuff. So I immediately tweeted it, right? How is this different than the past? In the past, you'd go out and you'd hope that maybe the newspapers would pick up the story, you know, 10 days later or whatever. So I tweeted it. Then the next step was, since... My Twitter is connected to my... So here you see it. It's Hofstra. Mounted police charge protesters and spectators. At least one injured. Well, I knew that for a fact. Six arrested. I knew that. So then when I got to the office, I called up the Nassau County Police Department. I called all the hospitals in the area. I called the Nassau County Jail, the local jail, the county jail, um, trying to find out who was arrested, what were their names, what were they charged with, was anyone injured, was anyone killed. Got no answers. Especially to the what were they charged with. I was kind of surprised, you know, no answers. So because that's linked to my Facebook wall, this immediately shows up in Facebook. So now people know there's something going on out here. So it, it posts here, and a guy named Jim Garrity says, yo, baby, be the media, because they ain't. Comments. People are commenting on this post already, you know, knowing, wow, the debate didn't even start. Something interesting is coming out of, uh, out of Hofstra University. But what were they protesting? What was the plan? Yeah, the point of the protest was they wanted to ask both candidates, not just one, um, when are they going to end both wars? Oh. That was the point of the protest. It was an act of, planned act of civil disobedience, nonviolent. Mm -hmm. So I put the post on to be the media, you know, a little bit crazy, a pandemonium outside Hofstra debate, but uh, next slide, so I want to go really fast. Um, next slide, you know, I put the video up on YouTube. Oh, this is basically, it was posted on, U on uh, Huffington Post. The previous slide, it was literally the front page of Huffington Post the night of the debate. 
And as you clicked in on that, you would get to this story. And the videos were on bethemedia.org. So, but the story isn't always inside the tent. Sometimes the story is outside the tent, as Peter well knows. It's uh, sometimes, in this case, an Iraq war veteran who goes thousands of miles overseas to fight for our rights of freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, comes back to presidential debate, and nearly gets his face trampled right on the streets in front of uh, this presidential debate. That, to me, was the story. The irony was not lost on me. Somebody started harassing me on my blog that very night. I kept getting these comments to my blog, and I, I usually drag them up here, but you can see them. Go to bethemedia.org, type in pandemonium. The comments came from three different supposed people, but they were all the same email, and they were all the same IP address. So clearly, it was clear to me, I didn't need to see the language to know what was going on, because I could see the IP address. This guy was too stupid to realize that I had his IP address. These harassing messages were coming through to me. And I was a coward. Because I had enough crap go on, you know, the stuff that I was doing here in Marin, and all the activism, I was tired of it, I also had a lot of work to do, and I was broke, and I was struggling to get my book out, and you know what, I just didn't have the time. But I ask you, like, I feel to this day like I was a coward because I didn't follow up on that story. What would you have done? There has never been a point in human history where people like you and me can not only participate, but also write the game, can actually affect the narrative. And a good example of that was this story. Newsday started hitting my blog when I started putting up the videos. So Newsday.com is the newspaper in Long Island, if you don't know. right? So they started hitting my blog. So I went to Newsday.com around 2 in the morning that night. And the story read like this. It read, um, protesters' face came into contact with horse's hoof. <laughs> that was the story, according to a police representative. You know? And then I could see that Newsday was hitting my blog all night long. By the time that story came out in the print version of Newsday the next day, completely different story. Well balanced, lots of pictures. And I think it was because they saw that I had photos, I had videos. We interviewed people at the scene. Every other journalist was in the freaking tent getting drunk. So they couldn't argue with the facts that something, there was another side to this story than what the police representative wanted or the police spokesperson, let's say, wanted the public to know about. So what happened there? It goes back to my optimistic part of this, is that you can actually affect the grand narrative. We can now write the game. Everyone in this room has the ability to actually affect the outcome. So the good news here is, I don't know if he's so depressing. You know, the good news is, 15 people were arrested, every one of those people, based on the photos and the videos taken on the scene, they were all let go, right? But Nick Morgan... Matter of fact, we're emailing back and forth right now. He's the only one who actually refused to settle. He's now taking aggressive action against the Nassau County Police Department to sue them. And so now I feel good that I'm actually saying, you know what, I'm going to come out on this. I'm going to give you everything that you need in order to pursue your case. But for a long time, for a year now, I've been like, oh, you know, I felt like I didn't do my job. But what is our job? Is this our job? I've got news for you right now. This is our job. Because journalism's dying, right? So whose job is it? to hold truth to power. But in the absence of professional journalists who won't do that, who's going to step up? Who's going to take care of getting a public access center in Marin? Who's going to take care of rogue police officers that are clearly overstepping their authority? Who's going to do it? You? Me? Jeff? No, I mean, you know. But the deeper I get into it, the, the more optimistic I am. I'm very optimistic, don't get me wrong. But I also realize we're in some you know, challenging times. So... You know, you get caught up in life, you get kids, you get put through school, you get things that you need to do. You know, who are those people that are going to take the place of the Woodwoods and Bernsteins and, and the others of the world who are holding truth to power? So we're in challenging times. That's, that's what I'm getting at, is we're in really challenging times. I didn't have the benefit. Even, you know, I could throw stones at the New York Times all day long, but the great news about it is at least they're giving resources and health care, you know, benefits packages to their employees so that they can do the longer term articles that take years or decades to undercover what's, uncover what's going on in the deeper mechanisms of both state and military control. But I don't have those resources, neither do any of the people in this audience, to be able to really, you know, dig into that. You know, federal shield law, you know, we're still, even Josh Wolf was put away. The most, the longest incarcerated independent journalist, he was just a kid, 20, 22 years old, you know, and he was put away for basically not wanting to divulge his sources. 
And that's why, again, we need things like federal shield laws. So 